All right, now it's time for the evolution lecture. This is lecture eight of the intro bio series. Uh, evolution is a topic that's often really misunderstood because while its results are fairly intuitive, the actual process uh, isn't always. And because of this, I will have a slide dedicated specifically to myths around evolution later in this lecture. Okay, so the moment someone says evolution, the first name that pops into anyone's head is probably Charles Darwin, which is because on his voyages on the HMS Beagle, he was really one of the first people to actually observe and uh, detail evolution, which is also known as natural selection. Uh, natural selection is really exactly what it sounds like. Individuals with favorable traits are selected, you could say, by nature to survive and reproduce, while those with un favorable traits tend to die out, so they do not reproduce. This means that those with favorable traits will pass on those favorable traits to their offspring, while those with unfavorable traits will not, and therefore these species trends towards the more favorable traits. An example of this uh, could be that there uh, was uh, a species of finch, which is a type of bird in the Galapagos that Darwin studied, pictured here on the bottom, and they had a variety of variations in beak sizes and shape, now, the finches that Darwin studied were a few different species, but for now, let's assume that two of them belong to one species, the left two labeled here as number one and three in the diagram. These finches may be almost the same genetically and could peacefully survive together uh, as, as one with the large beak, probably maybe or eight nuts, and needed this large beak to break open the nuts, while on the other hand, the one with the smaller beak might have eaten insects and needed the precision of a small and sharp beak to do so. Let's say one day a series of storms or a volcano or something caused a relatively long winter, resulting in both finches running extremely low on food. This might end up with the small-beaked finches dying out because all their uh, insects, which they normally eat, would be dead, while the large-beaked finches could still eat stockpiled nuts. That's a pretty simple example, and not one that Darwin directly uh, observed, actually just made it up, but that's pretty much how it works. Um, Organisms in a species with traits that benefit them in adverse situations like that long winter tend to survive and reproduce while ones that uh, don't benefit the species will die out. Anyway, Darwin uh, developed three broad principles that uh, govern evolution based on his, uh, sorry, um, based on his observations. Uh, characteristics of organisms are passed on to their children, which in modern day we know to be true due to genetics. Two, more offspring are produced than can survive. And three, offspring vary in their inheritance of characteristics, which we also know to be true using modern molecular genetics. Okay, so that's good and all as a theory, but what proof do we actually have for evolution? Well, it turns out quite a lot. Uh, starting with fossil evidence, we can actually use the rate at which certain elements decay into other, into other elements to figure out uh, how old certain types of fossils are. And then we can uh, link uh, that to, uh, or rather, we can we can use their age to uh, link two groups of organisms. For example, there's a fossil of Archaeopteryx that links together modern birds and prehistoric reptiles like dinosaurs really, really well. Next, we have uh, comparative biochemistry, which demonstrates that certain proteins are found in all life, uh, but with very slight variation and there are fewer variations in organisms that are evolutionarily related. There is also comparative uh, embryology, which is really cool because you can see that the early embryos for uh, nearly all mammals are almost identical for a really long part of the pregnancy. Next, biogeography. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the continent Pangaea, which was this landmass that existed before the current continent system. Uh, and we can still find the same types of fossils on the coast of Africa and on the coast of South America in some cases, which are currently really far apart, but were, but were right next to each other during the time of Pangaea. Okay, uh, comparative anatomy is when organs from different organisms are compared. Homologous structures are structures that come from uh, different lineages, but are, or, sorry, are structures that come from the same lineage, but are used in different ways. For example, uh, mammal limbs, uh, we use our limbs for two things really, moving on land via walking and manipulating objects with our hands. But bats, which are also mammals, have limbs which they have modified to the point where they can be used to fly, while whales have modified limbs that are used to swim. Now, um, 
Analogous structures are when two organs from different lineages appear similar because they uh, serve a very similar purposes. The best example of this are bat wings versus bird wings and insect wings. All three of them are used to fly and they're all extremely efficient um, and they even look pretty similar in some cases, but they came from three completely different classes of animal, which is pretty crazy. Finally, vestigial structures are organs that no longer serve a purpose. For example, the human appendix, which doesn't do anything on our body, but might have helped our ancestors digest a certain type of food that's no longer in our diets. All right, with all that information in mind, here's a quick question. Whale pelvic bones are an example of which of the following? I'll give you a few uh, seconds to answer, and you can pause the video in that time. After that, I will go over the correct answer. Okay, the answer here is vestigial structures, because pelvic bones are usually used to support free movement for legs using a ball and socket joint in the hips of animals that walk on land. But whales never really need to walk, yet they still have extremely uh, small pelvic bones. Uh, wh why is this? Probably because one of their ancestors at some point in time did need to walk and therefore needed those pelvic bones, which makes them a vestigial structure in the modern day. Okay, now we're finally at the misconceptions slide of the presentation. Uh, the first big misconception is that individuals evolve. Individual members of a species do not have the power to change their physical traits in such a way that it'll make them more likely to survive. Uh, you're pretty much stuck with what you've got genetically. Instead, evolution is always used on the scales of uh, populations and larger. So individuals themselves don't evolve, but their populations or species as a whole can. Next, organisms do not have an intent to evolve. Uh, there was actually a scientist at around the same time as Darwin called Lamarck that believed that physical pressure or stress resulted in animals physically changing their bodies to evolve. Uh, the example he often used was that of a giraffe, which he said likely have long necks to reach uh, leaves and tall trees. Uh, he stated that the ancestors of giraffes um, probably looks like horses and probably always craned and stretched their necks to reach the tallest leaves. Uh, and this physical stress of stretching meant that their children would have longer necks. Of course, this was pretty much completely wrong. In reality, what, what would have happened is that the horse-like animal with the longest neck would have been the best fed because it could reach the most leaves. So they would have the best chance of survival, which means they would reproduce the most and they would pass on um, the most genes uh, which would code for longer necks. So you would have the most members in the next generation with longer necks and so on and so forth uh, until we get to giraffes with crazy long necks. Finally, there's the misconception that evolution is just a theory. Um, this is technically true by just, I guess it is technically a theory, but it's often used by people to discredit evolution when they uh, don't want to believe in science for whatever reason, and therefore they use theory here without knowing exactly what it means. A theory in science is used to promote the fact that an idea is not set in stone and may be modified. Evolution is as much of a theory as gravity, and we don't completely understand gravity, but it's pretty much impossible to refute. The same goes for evolution. It's, it definitely exists, but we maybe don't understand every little facet of it to completion. Okay, now we're going to talk about species, uh, which is another scientific word we hear a lot and is actually pretty straightforward. A species is essentially any group of individual organisms that can reproduce and to produce fertile offspring. So for example, if two fruit flies reproduce, uh, they will produce a ton more fruit flies that can then reproduce uh, to make more fruit flies, so on and so forth, which will completely ruin any fruit you have. Um, but now the last bit of that definition is pretty interesting. It turns out that two separate species, like lions and tigers, can actually reproduce, uh, but they'll create an organism called a liger. Um, and uh, however, these ligers can't reproduce themselves. Uh, they're infertile, uh, which, which means that, that they can't make more of each other, which means that lions and tigers are unfortunately not of the same species. Okay, next we'll be taking a look at speciation which is the process of making a new species because a population is forced apart. Um, and this can happen in two ways, or there are really two types of speciation. There is allopatric speciation, um, 
which is when a new species forms because a population is forced apart from the rest of the species by some geographical event like a natural disaster. And on the other hand, sympatric speciation is when speciation occurs due to something other than geography. Uh, this can be when two populations have different habitats, behave differently, are active at different times, physically cannot reproduce, or in the case of plants, due to polyploidy. I went over polyploidy in the uh, last lecture, but to review, it's when an organism has more than two full copies of its DNA. Um, and organisms with a different number of copies, even uh, if they would normally be in the same species, cannot reproduce. So if a few blueberry plants on a blueberry farm end up having four rather than two copies of their DNA through some crazy uh, copying error, they would only be able to reproduce with each other and not with the uh, diploid organisms. All right, so like I said earlier, evolution is really just natural selection, but it turns out there are a few different types of selection. The first one is called directional selection uh, and occurs when the gene pool trends towards a completely different phenotype than where it's currently at. One example of this is a type of British moth that uh, was generally pretty lightly colored called the peppered moth. It relied on its light coloration to camouflage itself on rocks and plants so it wouldn't be eaten by predators. However, in the mid-1800s, there was so much soot being produced by the Industrial Revolution that these light-peppered moths were standing out against the now really, really dark rocks and trees which were covered in soot. So, the only, so, so only the moths that were darker survived, and their, color phenotype, uh, and, and their color phenotype moved directionally from light to dark. Another type of selection is diversifying selection. In this case, extreme phenotypes are selected for over mild ones. For example, in a desert with only really dark and really light rocks, mice with in-between coats, so like grayish coats, would be easy to spot, but ones with extremely light or extremely dark coats will, be, uh, will, will easily be able to hide and uh, pass on their genes by reproducing. Finally, in stabilizing selection, the most moderate phenotypes are favored. An example of this is human birth weight, which is uh, safest in the 6 to 8 pound range. If it's less than 6 pounds or more than 8 pounds, infant mortality tends to increase. Okay, next we're going to be talking, uh, or we're going to be taking a look at the Hardy-Weinberg equation, which is uh, used to calculate the, frequen the frequency at which certain alleles show up in the population. Specifically, these uh, equations are p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, and p plus q equals 1 where uh, P is the dominant allele and Q is the recessive allele. So normally in questions like this, we use, uh, so uh, sorry, questions like this use um, decimals to represent a percentage. So that's just something to keep in mind. Also, it may seem like this equation came from nowhere, but it actually makes sense if we consider the Punnett square for two heterozygous organisms. There are two PQ, or two PB genotypes in this Punnett square, along with a PP and a BB, or a P squared and a Q squared, in the case of the actual equation. All right, let's take a look at a practice problem. If 16% of a human population has blue eyes, what percent is heterozygous? Well, we know blue eyes are recessive, so Q squared equals 0.16. We can take the square root to get Q equals 0.4, and therefore p equals 1 minus 0 0.4 or 0 0.6, because remember, p plus q equals 1. From here, we know that, uh, give me a minute to update my slides. There we go. From, yeah, so, oh uh, yeah, so, so from here, we know that the heterozygous frequency is 2 times p times q, or 2 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.6, which is 0 0.48 or 48%. Remember that uh, 0 point whatever is that percentage in this case. That's just how we deal with percents. Let's do another example. Uh, determine the genotype frequencies if the recessive allele frequency is 0 0.3 for a certain trait. Well, that means Q is 0 0.3 and P is 1 minus Q or 0 0.7. So the homozygous dominant allele frequency or P squared is 0 0.7 squared or 0 0.49, which is 49%. The homozygous recessive allele frequency is Q squared, or 0.3 squared, which is 0.09, or 9%. Uh, 
Finally, the heterozygous frequency is 2 times p times q, or 2 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.7, which is 0 0.42, or 42%. Okay, I'm going to ask you one of these Hardy-Weinberg equations. Uh, if 4% of a p population is wrinkled, what percent is heterozygous? Uh, I'm going to give you a few seconds, go ahead and pause the video, and then I'll go over the answers. Okay, so we know that q squared is, in this case, 4%, or 0 0.04, which means that q is 0 0.2. Therefore, p is 1 minus q, 1 minus 0 0.2 is 0 0.8, which means that the frequency of heterozygous alleles, or 2 times pq, is 0 0.32, or 32%. So the correct answer choice is C. All right, now we're going to take a look at uh, patterns of evolution, which are essentially just ways evolution can occur. The first is divergent evolution, which is when two populations that were once similar are exposed to different environments, resulting in one species splitting in two, which is basically speciation. Uh, next is convergent evolution, which is the opposite. It's when two very different populations become increasingly similar due to the same selective pressures. Then there's parallel evolution, uh, in which two evolutionarily related species go through <clears throat> similar adaptations after they diverge from each other. And finally, coevolution, which is characterized by two interacting species evolving to outdo each other, uh, usually in the case of predators and prey. All right, now I'm going to very briefly go over the modern applications of evolution. First of all, there's two competing theories regarding the rate of evolution, uh, gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. Essentially, punctuated equilibrium states that evolution occurs in short but strong bursts, while gradualism says it's spread equally. Uh, there was a debate between these two for a while, but the general consensus is now that punctual uh, equilibrium is quite a bit more accurate. Next, we have EVO-DEVO, which is short, short for evolutionary, uh, sorry, evolutionary Developmental Biology. And it, it includes heterochrony, which is the rate of development in different species. So, uh, for example, while uh, adult humans and adult chimp skulls are extremely different, infant human and infant chimp skulls are nearly identical. There is also homeotic genes, which are a bit more complicated uh, but really, they're kind of like a blueprint that act as like master regulatory genes that determine placement of different organs and features uh, in different body segments. And they're found and organized pretty similarly in pretty much all animal life. Finally, evolution has been applied to the origin of life. Uh, there's this theory called the RNA world, which states that life's first genomic material was just many small chunks of single-stranded RNA. That's pretty much it for this lecture's content. Uh, now I'll be reviewing everything we've gone over in this lecture so far. First of all, Darwin's uh, three principles are that uh, uh, were that characteristics of an organism pa um, are passed on to their children, more offspring are produced than can survive, and that offspring vary in their inheritance of these characteristics. I also went over the huge array of evidence for evolution, which included fossils, biochemistry, embryology, biogeography, and comparative anatomy. Additionally, a species is a group of individuals that can reproduce and make fertile offspring, while speciation is the formation of a new species. Uh, and there are three types of selection, pictured with these three graphs to the right here, and they are directional, diversifying, and stabilizing, res uh, respectively. Finally, there are four key patterns of evolution, and these are divergent evolution, convergent evolution, parallel evolution, and coevolution. All right, that's about it for the eighth introductory biology lecture. I'll see you all next time.